At a time when concerns over data privacy are growing across the world and the European General Data Protection Regulation, better known by its acronym, the GDPR, has set a new standard for data collection, storage and usage for companies operating in Europe, India continues its quest towards creating a foolproof data protection framework. Meanwhile, the Reserve Bank of India in April has asked all payment system operators in the country to store data relating to their customers here in India. This in order to ensure that user details remain secure in case of privacy breaches. Payment system companies have been given six months to comply with the RBI's new localization norms. Currently, only a few payment system operators and their outsourcing partners store user data either partially or completely in India. The question we ask today is, does restricting the flow of data across borders risk India's global competitiveness? And also, does such a move necessarily enhance security of data? Moreover, what is the kind of privacy legislation that India should adopt, keeping in mind what is happening globally? Good evening. Thanks very much for joining us on Eye on India. I'm Shireen Bhan. Before we get any further, let's try and understand the rationale that prompted the Reserve Bank to come out with the data storage norms, also known as the localization norms. Also, how are payment companies reacting? Kevin Lee joins us now to give us the breakdown. Kevin. Well, the central bank keen to keep payment India of Indian citizens within the geographical boundaries of India. Here's a little bit of the fine print. Companies have to comply by October 15th this year. And also, auditors who have been impaneled by CERT will have to certify this report that each company submits to the Reserve Bank. Now, what is the RBI's rationale for wanting to do this? Firstly, rightly, as you mentioned, they want to reduce data breach risks uh, that happen in India. And more importantly, they want unfettered and exclusive access to payment data for supervisory purposes so that they can keep a close eye and monitor uh, any breaches that happen within India. What are the arguments against the RBI circular, most of these coming in from payment companies themselves that have to comply. Firstly, that the compliance window is too short. Six months is too short a time for these companies to comply with these new regulations. Remember, European companies had two years to comply with the GDPR norms before they came into effect. So that's the first complaint from companies. Secondly, setting up data centers and infrastructure within India will take some time. Now, if all these foreign companies have to shift all of that data within India's boundaries, that means more server farms, more data centers, things like real estate, etc., will be involved. So that infrastructure needs to come up as well. Companies are also saying that before we enforce this, India's data protection law must be made clear. Remember the Justice Sri Krishna-led committee coming out with that draft bill shortly, but that's not out yet, and companies want some clarity before uh, complying with these orders. Also, there is uncertainty on whether do data localization will actually ensure better security. There's no empirical proof of this. This is something that the RBI will claim will happen, but companies not so sure. And also, loss of efficiencies for foreign companies. They'll have to spend more money setting up custom cloud solutions or data centers within India, and it might not be as feasible for them to do business in India as it was before the circular. So this is the RBI's rationale, and these are some of the concerns that companies have. All right, Kevin, appreciate you joining us there and detailing for us the reservations that companies have with respect to the RBI circular, uh, suggesting that payment system operators set up data centers here in India. But before we get into that debate, let's talk about the road ahead as far as data, India's trysts with data privacy is concerned. Joining us today, three very special guests, Rama Vedishri, the CEO of Data Security Council of India. Also with us, Ashutosh Jain, the Chief Information Security Officer of Access Bank, and Vidur Gupta, partner cybersecurity at EVA. I appreciate you joining us here on the show. Uh, Rama, let me start by asking you, you're a member of the Sri Krishna Committee, so I don't want you to uh, sort of, you know, give us a sense of uh, what the Sri Krishna Committee report is finally going to say, but certainly do share with us when we can expect the report to be finalized. And broadly, uh, you know, there is a view that Perhaps India doesn't need to go all the way to the GDPR guidelines. Maybe we need to find a middle path. What will work for India when it comes to data privacy and protection, when we live in an era where data is the new currency? Thank you, Shireen. Uh, yes, we were uh, working towards uh, bringing out the report and the uh, data protection draft law uh, around the June time frame, but given the complexity of the topic and the stakeholders that need to be consulted, it's taking some time. Essentially, the data protection uh, committee and the report that we will bring out, we are looking at ensuring that there is a national level data protection legislation which will implement the uh, Supreme Court judgment about right to privacy being a fundamental right. And it will look at 
how will India look at the personal data and the sensitive personal data and the enforcement mechanism that needs to be in place so that both public sector agencies and the private sector agencies conform to this law, whoever is dealing, who's collecting, processing and sharing personal data. Mm -hmm. uh, by when do you expect you will be able to finalize this report? And I also want to ask you, since you raised the issue about not just putting the legislation in place, but also enforcement, is there a need for a regulator to monitor? Uh, time frame, I think we will know sooner. We are working on that. Uh, I think uh, Ministry of I Electronics and IT and Justice Sri Krishna are better placed to commit on the exact timeline. But definitely the committee is looking at, you know, speeding up the process and bringing it out. Not in terms of a regulator for data, but in, in terms of an enforcement uh, mechanism, obviously there has to be some authority which will look at implementing this legislation, bringing out the codes of conduct, bringing out the guidelines, and also the capability that is needed at an institutional level to be able to implement this at the scale of the country, at a state level, and the private sector and the public sector. Mm. Given the diversity, given the fact that you are putting in place a national data protection legislation, uh, what in your assessment have been the big challenges that the committee has had to face with? First of all, I think we need to get real clarity on what that personal data is all about and how do we balance the our aspirations to have a one trillion dollar digital economy and make India a global hub for digital data and then look at what is the obligations of mm. private sector, public sector, large, small enterprises which collect personal data and process data and also make sure we balance that the innovation ecosystem and given the state and the central, what is this enforcement mechanism? What is the capability that mm. is needed at an institutional level? Vidur, let me ask you, how prepared uh, are government agencies, government bodies, corporate India, uh, as we move through this area of opportunity uh, to capitalize on data, but also protect it? Thank you, Shreen. Uh, so perhaps let me take it in two parts. Uh, how prepared is perhaps the India Inc. or corporates? I, I would say, yes, they have covered quite a fair journey uh, in terms of the investments around data protection, data privacy. They have been able to do that uh, yeah, to a fair extent. Mm. Uh, when it, we talk about government, uh, of course, in the last few years, the thrust on uh, digitization, uh, you know, uh, getting our e-governance services, uh, citizen services digitized, that has happened, uh, that has covered a lot of distance. But in terms of preparation around data protection, data security, uh, there's a long way to go, mm. be it in terms of the awareness or be it in terms of the even realization mm. of what amount of data that we are sitting on. Okay, so you're saying that the gap is significant. Uh, you know, where is the starting point of starting to bridge this gap, Vidur? Uh, what is it that you expect the government to do? What is it that you expect the private sector to do in order for us to try and bridge this gap and bridge this deficit? So perhaps, uh, Shireen, I'll, I'll say uh, the first thing which to start with, which Rama also picked up, is, is a stringent data protection law mm. uh, has to be in place. That, that something has to be a starting point. Uh, we've been waiting for quite some time in terms of uh, for a privacy law or as well as an IT Act uh, amendment, amendment to come in. Yes, to come yes. in. Uh, that's something which needs to be there. Second, I personally definitely believe there has to be a robust regulator kind mm. of a thing, which mm. is essentially an enforcement body which is going to look at various government as well corporate elements that okay. uh, are they actually following those guidelines are they actually doing it and the third is in terms of the thrust around awareness itself i i believe that as citizens yeah. there's a huge gap in terms of just the uh, you know basic cyber hygiene or basic data protection yeah. hygiene itself so those are the three things i think three basic pillars we'll have to start working on yeah. uh, uh, to to, uh, you know, I, I, I want the two of you, and Rama, let me start by asking you, uh, let's be realistic here. We're already in July. The report has not been finalized yet. Uh, we're headed into general elections in 2019. We're talking about a new law, a new piece of legislation. Uh, you know, would it be a realistic expectation to, uh, to think that we will, in fact, have a new legislation in place ahead of the 2019 general elections, or should we then prepare for amendments to the IT Act to ensure that some of the concerns that we've talked about are in fact addressed? Any lawmaking of this subject will take time and even once the Data Protection Committee releases the report and the draft law, there would be some public consultations. I think the ministries will take up 
that consultations with various stakeholders in government, and then the lawmaking process starts. I think the lawmaking process, uh, I'm not really equipped to comment on mm. what is the time frame that is needed. Yeah. But even once the committee submits, there would be some public consultations on the draft law and, of course, some stakeholder consultations that I, I presume the government will host. Mm. So that would take its time. I think, but if you look at uh, the Supreme Court judgment, we like to believe that whether it's the tech industry or some of the large corporates who are dealing with personal data mm. are already beginning to implement privacy programs so that they become responsible with the way they deal with privacy data. So while the law is a very important milestone and enforcement and the capability building, but I would like to believe and place the <coughs> argument to you that tech industry and the large corporates, whether it's the banking sector, the telecom sector, anybody who's dealing with mm. personal data, yeah. are beginning to put privacy programs in place, which I think is a good thing. Okay, uh, Ashutosh, let me ask you, as a corporate citizen now, uh, you're sitting on a, a ton of data, and we've seen that uh, surge as far as digital transactions are concerned, especially when it comes to things like mobile banking, etc. Uh, what is it that you have been able to do at your end to ensure that, uh, uh, you know, the data is in fact protected and where do you see uh, things moving down the road yeah so uh, Shirin first I will actually you know address this that uh, there is always a shared responsibility for any kind of public facing services that any institution is bringing the shared services essentially mean that the institution also has to play a part that actually they are providing a very secure service to all yeah. the uh, customers their customers and the customers are also playing their part of actually ensuring that they are uh, using those services and uh, uh, responsibly because they should not be sharing the password and all of the well-known things what we know uh, what we actually you know uh, uh, have campaigns around them to ensure that people are not doing those things mm. now when it comes to on the cop uh, on the corporate side you know there are uh, specific things which actually are now yeah, as the maturity is now increasing in large corporate sectors uh, there actually is a need for uh, threat detection a very deep capability of threat detection a very uh, a fast response time for threats what are actually emerging on the yeah. radar uh, either within or outside the perimeter and also for actually sharing the threat intelligence now for that we have definitely uh, at the uh, at the national level the cert uh, india cert which actually is playing at the national level rbi for the banks and likewise for specific regulators are also playing that part uh, uh, on the specific sectoral way uh, but uh, uh, even at a very broad base, mm. all the institutions needs to come together to actually, you know, start collating that information, which in turn gives the capability as a nation to come forward mm. to deal with those things. But is any of that happening today, Ashutosh? Indeed, actually, and that's the reason a lot of actually institutions are able to uh, address those threats in a very meaningful manner, and that's the reason uh, many institutions are uh, uh, are able to handle those threats. Uh, data leakage prevention also is a very, very critical part of this entire thing, where uh, by variety of means the hackers can actually potentially take data yeah. out of the institution, and all of them are taken care. Mm. You know, give me a sense of what kind of spends uh, you, for instance, have been able to put in place uh, uh, to ensure that you have the adequate systems and processes in place in terms of building capabilities within the organization. Give me a sense of what it's taken for you to get where you are today in this quest for data protection. So actually, yeah. So. It's a it's a complete journey it's uh, in itself, uh, Shireen. It is never that you know we make a spend and then you know we actually are happy about it that we have made a spend. It is all about not only spending but also taking the maximum out of it by ensuring that the 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 tools, the capabilities, the people and the institution as a culture itself evolves into a very secure entity as a whole and that takes a lot of pain and a complete roadmap over years which actually builds on and on. Okay. Uh, you know, I want to now address a controversial and contentious issue. And Rama, let me start by asking you about that. We've seen that RBI April circular, which basically states that the payment of uh, payment data of Indian citizens needs to be stored in India. Companies have been given till the 15th of October this year to comply with those regulations. Uh, a, do you believe that this is a realistic expectation uh, to have you know, payment companies set up servers in India. Uh, and do you believe that this argument that it localization will be, uh, you know, a, a safeguard for data protection and data privacy, does that hold water? First of all, I think when you look at the current uh, 
status of digital economy and digital data flows. It's almost a global data grid. Mm. The financial and digital payment systems are one of the best examples of what a global digital data grid is. But it also can be applied to, for example, the higher education space where physical and virtual learning centers have effectively become a global data grid. You could look at that even in the uh, multi-channel retail systems where physical and virtual uh, stores are uh, converging together. Yeah. So when, it looks, when you look at digital payments, my personal view and conviction is that any digital economy needs data to be sh shared, processed, and uh, across uh, the borders of so geographies. So cross-border flow is important. Cross-border flow is very important. That is what has fueled the entire digital economy and the IT industry, tech industry growth in India. And if we have to realize the aspirations of India becoming a $1 trillion digital economy, mm. I believe that cross-border data flows is very central to that. Okay. Uh, do you believe that this will hurt India's competitiveness? Uh, because so far, uh, the, the Reserve Bank is not backing down the uh, April circular stands, despite the fact that we've seen the USIBC and other such bodies uh, uh, arguing against it. I think it also hurts not just the global technology or digital payment players which operate out of India, but also the fintech innovation that mm. is getting. India is becoming a hub for fintech innovation, and a lot of fintech players operate on global platforms. They serve global markets out of India, and there are other geographies which have already taken the edge, and if India needs to leapfrog in the digital innovation space, I think uh, a regulation like this would definitely hurt. Okay, uh, Vidur, let me put that question to you. Uh, you know, the rationale given by the Reserve Bank is that this is essential to reduce risks of data breaches so that there is constant monitoring. It's necessary to have unfettered access to payment data for supervisory purposes. But then you have the argument against this, which is the argument that this is anti-innovation, it is anti-competitiveness. It is, in fact, going to hurt India uh, in the long term. And there might, in fact, even be backlash from countries like the U.S. if we enforce this. So uh, if, if as a cybersecurity professional, I had to say, I, I think uh, uh, perhaps it does not ensure 100% safety or security. But uh, uh, from an end citizen uh, data perspective, I, I think perhaps I would say that, yes, it does make sense to have a data localization. Having said that, it's going to be an extremely technological, uh, 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 you know, up task mm. for implementation in terms of how does that data get segregated. Yeah. If, if, if it, um, and how uh, do you segregate between Indians' data and you know other citizens and so on and so forth? I mean, le let's look at the practical challenges of this as well. Absolutely right. When when we uh, all of us talk of social media, we are so interconnected in terms of this. This essentially regulation would mean that they have to replicate their entire data centers in India as mm. well. So obviously, the practical element is going to be huge. But perhaps something which government can definitely try and look at is that how do we? identify certain initiatives of citizens, which is predominantly to do with Indian citizens only. Okay. And that data needs to be ensured uh, to stay within the uh, Indian geographical borders. Okay, Ashutosh, is this an issue that uh, uh, is uh, sort of taking up bandwidth uh, at Axis? Are you looking at what the RBI circular says and the implications of it? Yes, uh, so we have already responded back uh, uh, with our kind of thing that we are fully compliant. Of course, you know, so uh, definitely, you know, uh, the continuum of all the players in the Indian market are is very huge. You know, we have uh, all uh, sizes of bank uh, and all types of bank within the country. So definitely, uh, you know, people may uh, take uh, different times, but I think uh, uh, we are in a good shape. Okay, you believe that we're in a, a good shape. On that note, we will take a break, but when we return, uh, we will ask our guests to give us a sense of what we should expect, what should we watch out for the red flags to be careful about. That and more when we return. On the other side, you're watching Iron India.